Welcome everyone. We're glad to have you today. Just a quick announcement that this webinar will begin in approximately three minutes. While we're waiting for the webinar to begin, you should know that Royal Circuit Solutions, Advanced Assembly, and DigiKey Electronics Corporation are giving away free assembled circuit boards to environmental and animal rights researchers. If you've got a project or you know somebody that does who's trying to help make the world a better place, visit royalcircuits.com, look into the blog, and you'll see our offer for five free boards, including parts, to anybody that asks, nonprofits, education. If you're trying to make the world a better place, let us help you out. Welcome everyone. My name is Mark Hughes and on behalf of the webinar sponsors, Royal Circuit Solutions and Advanced Assembly, I'd like to welcome you here today. Royal Circuit Solutions and Advanced Assembly are the industry's original quick turn PCB fabrication and assembly experts. Whether you need help to get your project done in 10 days or 10 hours, we're your guys. Visit aapcb.com and royalcircuits.com to learn more. We're joined here today by Chris Hunrath, Bob Martin, and Larry Ibarra. Together, they have over 100 years of PCB manufacturing experience. Today is the first day of a two-part webinar series that will be continued next Thursday at the same time. This webinar will be recorded and posted to the Royal Circuits blog page and YouTube channel within two business days. As we go through the webinar, please ask questions in the Q&A box, not the chat. All right, let's get to know our presenters. First up, we've got Chris Hunrath of Inselectro. He's the Vice President of Technology there. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Chris. Uh, sure, uh, I started in circuit boards back in 1983, working on multi-wire circuit boards. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it was a, uh, it was a uh, polyam encoded wire technology that was embedded in a film and then laminated kind of like conventional PCBs. Um, Worked there, worked in that uh, technology for uh, for some years, nine years, and then uh, worked on high volume PCB equipment, chemistry suppliers, and then been with Inselectro uh, over 19 years now. And uh, we're a material supplier to the PCB uh, industry. Uh, we cover everything from um, printed electronics to uh, to flex PCB to rigid PCB. So, kind of in my blood, uh, PCBs on. Um, very, uh, I consider myself a material science geek, <laughs> and uh, you know, as uh, as technology uh, progresses, uh, the the material and the nature of the boards or the materials that go into them are becoming more and more important. So uh, that's just my background, and hopefully, I can uh, I can help out, uh, you know, the, the folks that attend this and Royal Circuits as well. Thanks, Chris. And. For anybody who hasn't heard me say it before, I refer to Chris as a walking encyclopedia of knowledge. Uh, really 
really a great resource for you designers out there. Next up, we've got Larry Ibarra. He's the Quality Assurance Officer at Royal Flex Circuits in Santa Fe Springs. Tell us a little bit about your background, Larry. Oh, I say my name is Larry Ibarra, Quality Assurance Manager here at Royal Flex. I've been here for four years. I've been in the industry a little over 40 years. I uh, started out with basic double-sided and to the, today's technology is doing flex, rigid flex, which is getting more and more challenging. And uh, we look forward to any questions you may have. And if we can help you out, we sure like to know. All right. Thanks so much, Larry. And our third presenter is Bob Martin. He's the Senior Vice President of Operations at Royals and Flex Circuits in Santa Fe Springs. Bob, what should we know about you? Hi, Al. Well, I've been at Royal Flex for about four years. I, I came, um, I have about 40 years in the industry. The last 25 or year, so I've been heavy concentration on polyamides, flexes, rigid flexes. So a pretty good background in that. Um, came to Flex, Royal Flex, in order to uh, grow this company that was very small, building, you know, some single-sided, double-sided flex. And, We've moved up to, you know, high layer count rigid flexes and things like that. And, you know, just watching the industry uh, kind of like, like Chris says, how it's changed material types and demands uh, and, and, and everything getting smaller and thinner and, and looking for flexibility. And, and we seem to be uh, positioned for that market. And then we're trying to, uh, you know, help with the engineering and, and you know, quick turn uh, applications for a lot of different markets. and engineering. All right. Thanks so much, Bob. With that, Chris, I turn it over to you. Tell us what we need to know. Okay. Um, you heard a little bit about, uh, you know, about myself, a little bit about the Royal, uh, the, the Royal Circuits team. Or Royal Circuits has a couple of different facilities, uh, one in uh, Hollister, the other down in Santa Fe Springs. Um, and of course, the, the Flex uh, folks are down in, uh, in Southern California in Santa Fe Springs. I don't know if you guys want to talk anything more about uh, Royal Flex, uh, Royal Flex yeah. circuits before. Yeah, I get Chris, I'll, I'll talk with them. Um, you know, Royal Flex in two groups. We have a, a Hollister, which is a, the the original Royal company, and they primarily build uh, rigid applications. They do a, a vast array of materials from high speed sub assemblies, stack vias, laser vias, those type of things. They really are fast in their rigid production. They, they've done, um, you know, 20 hour turnarounds. Um, just recently we did one for uh, uh, Blue, uh, Blue Horizon, I think that was called for ventilators and stuff. We actually took the design and, and, and uh, the salesman delivered it for, uh, on a, off an airplane and flew down here and, and took it to them in, in a little over 20 hours, we had the, the parts to them. So, so there's uh, opportunities like that up north. Uh, down south in Santa Fe Springs, you know, we're trying to take the same type of uh, 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 abilities and, and build on it for flex and rigid flexes. Uh, though they flex and rigid flex tends to take a little longer. There's more processing involved, but uh, we do some pretty fast um, turnarounds. We built rigid flexes as fast as three days. Um, flexes we kind of do routinely, standard flexes in, in three to four days. So. Um, depending on design and, and, and uh, complexity, we can turn things around pretty fast. We continue to buy new equipment and modernize continuously. That's helped us, uh, you know, keep up our pace and buying special ovens to bake faster, new equipment to, uh, you know, just process quicker. Um, we're in the background bringing in new equipment, more accurate, more vision related uh, equipment to do tighter and tighter features. So. Uh, overall, as a company, we, we continue to modernize and, and try to deliver even faster and faster turn time. So that's our goal. Back to you, Chris. Yep. Okay. Thanks. So Inselectro, we're a material supplier. Uh, we supply all kinds of materials for the, the uh, electronics market. It's not just PCB. Uh, we're doing more and more in the wearables and printed electronics. Flex is a very big part of our business. Um, we're introducing some new products, some of which I'll talk about today. Um, some, and 
with all the different resin systems and part numbers out there, no one board shop could possibly inventory everything. So that's part of our value prop is that we, we have a pool of inventory that our customers can pull from as new designs come in. It helps them respond faster. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's really a big part of our business. Uh, we do a ton of will call business where, where PCB shops, PCB fabs will come in and pick up material that they might've ordered 30 minutes prior. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, we're always looking to step up our game, uh, add new products to our line. And, uh, you know, again, hopefully, uh, you know, you guys can ask us some things that might uh, impact, you know, what we decide to, uh, or which materials we decide to stock. Mm -hmm. So we're always open, always open to feedback and opportunities in that way. We think it's a win-win for everybody involved. So that's a little bit about Inselectro. I'm going to get into the materials side of it, and then we'll get into a little bit about the, uh, the products and the designs. So lots of materials in electronics industry. Um, and when I work with designers and OEMs and, and fabricators, um, it's, a, it's surprising to me, not surprising, that's not a good word. It, it's, there's just so many different materials and they each have their, their strengths and weaknesses. Um, that's where the fabricator comes in. Fabricator in combination with, with folks like us we can help guide the guide the design phase. Really, the ultimate goal here is to have a functioning circuit that does what what's expected of it from the get go, without having to go through multiple iterations. Sometimes you can't avoid that. In other words, design changes, even material changes at times. But the idea is to hit the ground running with with these uh, with these products. It saves everybody time, saves everybody money. I'm just going back to what we stock. Um, we support on the rigid side, you know, over 30 resin systems, but we only stock nine. Many of those are specialty or legacy and we can't stock everything. And we have, we have tens of thousands of part numbers in our stock, uh, to support our, our customer base. So, um, again, we try and help with the, uh, help guide the material process. Um, and you can see some of the examples here. I'm just going to, uh, call out a few things here. And um, obviously you see the rigid uh, flex in the middle, uh, lower middle section of this. Um, what you're seeing above it is touch membrane switch. Then you have high speed back planes in the upper left. You can see a flex circuit, of course, in the, in the, um, the upper right, you can actually see some high temperature polyamide based ink screen and capped on to make a printable heater. So lots of different ways this the technology can go. And that's really our role is to help help uh, folks like yourselves, uh, you know, pick the right material for the application. So why flex, right? Flex is a huge area of growth for us and for our, our, our fab uh, customer base. And you can see just a few of the applications here. Um, you know, obviously uh, the polyamide flex has a long history of reliability. It's in the Mars rovers and the, all the rovers, I, I think with very few exceptions have exceeded their life expectancy, uh, you know, on Mars. And Mars is a, you know, you have radiation, you have big temperature swings, you have very harsh environments and Flex does very well in those applications. Lots and lots of medical applications coming up. And I just have some snippets here. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Da Vinci or heard of the Da Vinci robot in the lower right. Uh, that's all Flex. Uh, cochlear implants use Flex. Of course, mobile electronics uses Flex. Automotive, um, and it just goes on and on and on. So it's an area that will continue to grow as electronics find their way into different uh, applications and the internet of things uh, brings electronics, uh, you know, in, into, into things that weren't traditionally electrified. So another great example has been to install. I like this example because on the left-hand side, you can see how the board looks when it's still in its panel form and that'll actually get folded in and, um, and then put into a package like you see on the right. Um, this is what we call bend and install. So bend and install um, can be hard on the flex in some ways, but it's not repeated bending. Um, so this is just an example of bend and install versus what we call dynamic flex, or, or there's even some things that are flexed occasionally. Dy dynamic flex might be something that you'd see in a, in a printer, uh, whereas uh, something that's flexed less often might be your laptop uh, screen. Um, and then, of course, you have bend install, which is only bent once, and then the package is put together. Uh, 
so flex circuits, I talked a little bit about all the, all the various applications. Um, Pyrolux is a DuPont trade name for flex circuits materials. It's obviously the material we provide. It's based on a polyamide film called Kapton. Kapton is an interesting material. Um, if anyone's familiar with, with polyamide rigid, uh, what makes, they're both based on an image cross-linked system, uh, polymer system. What makes them different is how they're cross-linked and how they're cured. Um, Pyrolux uh, or, and Kapton film is cured in a very different manner than rigid polyamide. Um, and that's why they have very different properties. Rigid polyamide tends to be very brittle, uh, whereas the Pyrolux is a lot more flexible, pliable, both very high temperature materials. Hey, Chris. Yes. We've got a question. Um, this is from a gentleman named Steve, and he asked, why is there such a long lead time for Pyrolux AP materials lately? Yeah, good question. A uh, combination of, of a big uh, uptick in demand. Um, and really, it's, uh, there, there was some equipment issues with the Pyrolux uh, capped on film capability or film manufacturing process. Um, just to give you a little background on that, the liquid polyimide is actually uh, coated onto a stainless steel belt and then run through a high temperature oven. It's actually almost, almost a furnace and that's how it's cast. And then it's peeled off the belt and then that becomes a building block to make the Pyrolux uh, uh, polyimide materials. That was shut down for a period of time for, uh, for uh, repair and maintenance. And then on top of that, it was kind of a perfect storm on top of that, there was an explosion in demand. So uh, those things together have created uh, some, some uh, bottlenecks. I am gonna talk about a, another polyamide material um, in the Pyrolux family called AG that's made on a different asset uh, that is not supply constrained. Uh, and that's later on in the presentation. All right, thanks Chris. So just some trivia on Kapton. Um, by the way, Kapton has been used in satellites um, Kapton and Mylar both have been sputtered with aluminum and gold um, uh, in satellite applications. So if anyone's seen what looks like tinfoil on, on, on uh, space, uh, space uh, um, chassis or, or housings, that's typically either Kapton or Mylar and it's been coated with a very thin film of metal. Uh, Kapton has been used in spacesuits. It was replaced with um, Kevlar. Kevlar is now the micrometeoroid barrier inside the, inside the layers of, a, of the spacesuit. Uh, but at one time it was used to stop, uh, you know, these microscopic meteors from causing a hole and an air leak in the, uh, in the spacesuit. It's also used in ignition coils, very, very commonly used in ignition coils. Um, people have seen kept on tape, lots of applications beyond flexible PC, PCBs, but it is, I like to use it as an analogy. It, it, if you look at rigid PCBs where fiberglass is the backbone and then you use resin as the, the bonding system and um, uh, the dielectric system to make that composite, in flex, it's the Kapton that replaces the fiberglass. It provides XY stability um, and it provides some of the other robustness you need in an in a electronic circuit. Very different than Mylar, which is very common, polyester film, PET film, that's used in uh, printed, uh, printed electronics. And the reason being is you, you need a flexible film that can withstand reflow assembly and Kapton does that very well. So I talked about this a little bit earlier. Really the goal for, for presentations like this and the team effort between OEMs, Royal Flex and Inselectro is, the, uh, really the goal is to get the design off the ground and working uh, at, at the lowest cost and the shortest time possible. And you guys don't need to be material science experts. That's our job. Um, you know, whereas the Royal Flex team is, they're the um, uh, fabrication experts, and in some cases, designed for manufacture, which is very important. So this is where we all work together to get, to get your product to market faster and to get it, uh, to get the whole project successful. Just a little review on, on rigid laminates. Um, Rigid PCBs, as I talked about, prepreg or fiberglass is the backbone, and then the resin's coated on it, dried, and then those are building blocks that you would laminate together to make both the core material and then eventually use those building blocks to put all the cores together to make a complex multi-layer. In the flex world, Kapton 
fills that role of the fiberglass. And just a common rigid core construction. Um, and you can see, you know, where the copper foil is applied to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what we call the B-stage fiberglass prepreg with the resin and it's bonded, cured, and, and how flex is made is similar to this. Um, after the Kapton film is cast, um, they co-extrude a very thin film of, of a thermoplastic polyimide, and then that's all put together with copper foil and an autoclave and laminated at very high temperature. That's laminated at over 600 degrees uh, to make the uh, AP, what we call the Pyrolex AP, or, or what they call adhesiveless uh, copper clad system. And then those are the building blocks for making flex circuits. In general, uh, really the purpose of this slide is just to let you know in general, um, thicker constructions are less expensive on rigid fiberglass systems and uh, uh, on the film side, as you go, there's a, there's a point where as you start to go higher in thickness, the cost goes up. It's just something to keep in mind. There are definitely reasons why you need thicker polyimid in a, uh, in a flex system. Uh, but once you start going over two mils, the cost goes up uh, dramatically because then you have to use multiple plies of the cast film. Um, and of course, it takes away from flexibility. Now, again, certainly for very high voltage or for impedance uh, purposes, you may need thicker uh, polyamides, but it's just something to keep in mind. So what your fabricator will do is take the, uh, take the copper clad uh, building blocks and they'll print an edge circuitry on them. Probably not a, not a mystery to most of the folks on this uh, webinar, but it's just nice to see that, you know, it goes from a, a copper clad sheet to printed and etched circuits, and then they use a bond treatment um, to get uh, good adhesion on the subsequent layers. Very important in flex to get good adhesion on systems because when layers start to come apart, that's where things can go wrong. Um, but um, that's a process that needs control. Again, that's, that's where you count on your fabricator to do a, a good job with that. Hey Chris, what's the uh, heaviest copper that we typically see in, this, in these applications? Well, so for flexibility purposes, thinner is typically better. Um, I've, seen, I've seen heavy copper. I've seen four ounce copper in a flex application. You're kidding, wow. Um, you know, and actually what made it a little bit more challenging is the, the board had uh, one ounce copper on one side and four ounce on the other. Ooh. Um, you know, so, obviously there's, there's, obviously there must have been a current reason to, um, to, uh, or power reason why they needed that thick of a circuit. It's not terribly flexible. So another thing to keep in mind. What would you think is a reasonable thickness to Ounce or? So, so half and half and one ounce is very good uh, for um, for flexibility. Uh, half ounce is very very good for flexibility. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the types of copper and 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 why you would use one over another, uh, because copper is not all copper, right? There are different kinds of copper regardless of the thickness. Um, but you know, you're you're better off with multiple plies of half ounce uh, than one thicker layer with some caveats. And again, we'll talk more about that when we talk about flex bending. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, just some important material pop properties, glass transition temperature, decomposition temperature, coefficient of thermal expansion, dielectric constant dissipation factor. I'll talk more about all of these, uh, but these are some of the properties we consider in the design phase. Um, not so much coefficient of thermal expansion in flex because flex tends to be thinner and that doesn't impact the design as much. Uh, but it is something, you know, the, to be aware of depending on the application. Decomposition temperature is important, um, especially with lead-free assembly and glass transition temperature is important for, uh, for how the, the circuit will perform. There are some cases where a flex circuit will do just fine if it's static in a hot environment. Uh, whereas if it's being flexed in a hot environment, you have to consider that much more carefully. By the way, just, just for definition purposes, glass transition temperature is when a material goes from a glassy state to a plastic state, which in flex, you, you know, you might find that a little strange because the flex circuits are always flexible, but that, that is a material property that we can measure. Decomposition is, uh, is when a material, material polymer starts to fall apart. The polymer chain starts to fall apart. You start um, losing some of the material. 
Um, of course, dielectric constant, I'll talk more about that dissipation factor as we go through this. So just some, again, some categories. Um, this applies to both rigid and flex. Um, we look at materials in the design phase at their dis dissipation factor and dielectric constant, and there's different tiers. So like, F, for example, FR4, <clears throat> you know, would be, would be a tier one material. Uh, whereas some of the very low loss Teflon based or, or liquid crystal polymer based or even, even poly polyimid Kapton based tend to be in the, in the tier three to tier five range, depending on how they're made and depending on how they're uh, put together. Again, more on that as we go through the presentation. So this is a chart of some bulk properties of, uh, of films, uh, film dielectrics. Um, this isn't all encompassing, of course. You, you don't see polyester film or PET film here. Um, and there, there are other, plenty of other films that we work with, but uh, these are some of the, the key films. Kapton HN is a flavor of Kapton that's used in Coverlay and Bond Ply. Um, Pyrolux AP has a different Kapton core in it, and then the very thin layer of the thermoplastic polyamide to bond the copper. Pyrolux HT is interesting. It's a relatively new product. It's a thermoplastic polyamide film that you could use as a building block. It does require high temperature uh, uh, lamination. Again, I'll talk more about that. Uh, Pyrolux TK is actually a Teflon capped on uh, laminate system. So it's what I call a laminar composite. Uh, has some very low dielectric constant properties uh, and very low loss properties. Uh, also needs high temperature lamination, but there's a new product that allows you to make composites or, or structures, multi-layer structures, without having to use high temperature lamination. Again, we'll talk more about that as we go through this. Um, just some general types of flex PCBs. Uh, I'm sure some of the folks on this, on this call are already familiar with this, but we have single-sided in the upper left, uh, then double-sided, uh, multi-layer flex, and rigid flex. Um, they all have their uh, place or, or applications, I should say, in, in the uh, world of electronics. Uh, they do have some special considerations in fabrication. There are some things you're gonna to wanna to do on a single-sided flex from a uh, pad layout that's different than what you would do on a double-sided because those holes are unsupported on the single-sided flex. And that's probably something we should save for the next, for part two of this. Um, but you know, just, just be aware that there's different flex, uh, flex types and they all have their, their needs. And again, uh, that's where you can rely on the, the uh, folks at Royal Flex to help uh, with that uh, design process. Just an overview of the flex materials. These are some of the building blocks. Again, not all encompassing. Um, back when flex material first came out, um, there was an acrylic intermediate between the, the Kapton core and this copper. Um, that's still produced and still sold, but by and large been replaced by the all poly image structures. Uh, they're much, much better for, uh, for thermal expansion, reliability, and other things. Um, again, we still produce the, uh, the acrylic clad systems for legacy work, uh, but primarily the industry has shifted to the all poly image systems. Um, and then you have the, the single-sided clad, uh, which is typically a liquid poly image cast on copper. Um, and again, not all encompassing. There are, there are different flavors of all these different, uh, different products. Then you have the acrylic uh, components that are used to bond layers together. Um, acrylic's a great, uh, a great material because it's sticky, very, very flexible, very long shelf life in its B stage form. Uh, has a lot of good properties. It is uh, somewhat limited in its thermal performance at the higher end. So when you start getting into high operating temperature environments, there's limitations to that. That's where some of the other new materials come in. Um, and then it is it's somewhat lossier. It's, it's like an FR4 and it's lost properties. So again, we'll talk more about those as we go through. Um, so we talked about Kapton being the backbone of the system. And of course the plated through hole, just like in rigid, the plated through hole is the link to link the internal layers or the back side if it's a double-sided to, uh, to the top side. Um, 
And there are a number of processes, uh, including electrolysis copper, that are used to do that. Um, again, that's where you count on the fabricator to be experts in this area. So just wanted to get, get the folks here familiar with the, uh, with the overall structure of the flex and how the layers are brought together. So Chris, how many layers can we reasonably put together here? How many layers of copper before you know, we're making a, a de facto rigid board? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there are a lot of, uh, it depends, <laughs> attributes to that. It depends on the uh, on the thickness of the polyimide film. It depends on the thickness of the copper layers. Um, when we get into talking about bend radius a little bit and, and bending uh, flex circuits, uh, it's best to put the hot, heaviest copper in the neutral axis uh, of where of where the bending will be. Um, and then there's also loose leaf flex. So um, and that's typically done on rigid flex. Um, Typically, you're limited to, I wouldn't say limited, but go, when you start to get beyond, let's say, four and, and six layers of flex, and it, a lot of it will depend on whether it's strip line or micro strip, but when you start to get into higher layer counts, you should definitely consider loose leaf constructions and, and thinner coppers and thinner polyimides for that matter. Uh, of course, all that has to work with the, with the electrical uh, parameters that are needed in the system. So if you need a particular impedance, very common structure is a three layer flex in a rigid flex design. So I'll give you an example is you have your two flex, rigid sections joined together by a, by a flex portion. And in that flex portion, you have your signals in the middle and then you have your reference plane on either side. Uh, that's a very common structure. If you need more signal layers, it might make more sense to do two of those um, structures and have what we call loose leaf flex, where you almost have two independent flex circuits on top of one another, but not bonded, uh, in, that both go into the rigid portion of the PCB. Yeah, I think I understand. So, I mean, you could effectively slip something in between there if you needed to, they're not glued. Correct. But really gotcha. what it allows them to do is flex independently, and then you're not, you're not getting a, a higher level of compression and, and, and stretching in the, in the bend area. And again, I've got a good, Good image to show what that looks like. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, you're welcome. So, so again, impedance, uh, dielectric control thickness, uh, or I'm sorry, dielectric constant thickness, trace width. These are all factors. Um, uh, signal loss, dynamic flex versus bend and install. There's things you can do with dynamic flex that you wouldn't necessarily do with bend and install, and vice versa. Uh, circuit density, of course. Uh, and then cost availability of the materials. And, you know, we're, we certainly understand the AP challenges right now in, in supply. That's why I'm going to talk about a, a new product called AG. Um, so all these things are, are factors that go into a particular design. And obviously, what we want to do, the, one of the goals is, is, of course, to make sure the system works. But the other is to, you know, have a cost and delivery that meets, your, uh, meet, that meets the design requirements or the project requirements. So just a little bit on dielectric constant. Uh, I'm sure most people have heard of that. Um, I put the uh, textbook definition up top of what dielectric constant is, or sometimes called uh, permittivity. Um, it's, um, but we, we in, the, in our industry, we just talk about dielectric constant. And really it's a material property independent of thickness um, and doesn't change with the, uh, um, uh, with the environment. However, at different frequencies, you'll get into different, or you'll get a different apparent dielectric constant. Obviously the material isn't changing, but it will, it will op operate like it has a different dielectric constant at higher frequencies. Um, moisture absorption can affect this as well. Um, again, that's where, that's where we can work with, uh, you know, the folks, uh, you know, interested in the project or design to help uh, give some good guidance. DuPont has a lot of electrical data on their products in various, uh, in various environments, both on Kapton and on, and on Pyrolux. Just a, a quick review of the metallization part of it. Um, there are a couple of rigid boards here and there's some flex. Actually, you can see uh, there's an example of four ounce copper and a flex <laughs> in the upper uh, middle picture. 
Uh, that hasn't been metallized yet, but that's been drilled. Um, and then of course on the right hand side, that's a multi-layer flex where you can see the uh, calcton layers and the acrylic adhesive layers. Uh, that isn't uh, necessarily easy to do um, because the materials have very different etch back characteristics in the pre-plate processes. Uh, but if done correctly, you can get nice plating throughout the system. Um, typically what we do in, in rigid flex designs is we keep the acrylic out of the rigid portion. You don't need it. And you typically don't put plated through holes in the flex or bend area in a rigid flex design. But in a pure multi-layer flex, you could have plated through holes through the acrylic. And this is an example of, of that uh, on the right-hand side. And of course, blind vias through holes, uh, laser vias, just like you would on a rigid board. Um, the structures are a little different, but the method is similar. So just some more things on material properties. Um, dissipation factor, and really that's, that's a pro just like dielectric constants, a property of the material. It affects how much the electric field in a circuit and mo we're really talking about high-speed digital circuits or RF circuits, um, but high-speed circuits, the material will absorb some of that energy and convert it into heat, uh, and that's a property of the material. Um, flex materials tend to do better than rigid, with the exception of the acrylic adhesive in this, in this regard, um, and it's important for, you know, for managing loss in the system, as well as, as, well as the copper foil. Uh, moisture absorption, something to, to keep, be aware of. It, if it can impact assembly and, of course, the dielectric properties of the material. Uh, time to delamination, that's something we do where we heat a sample and we measure how long it takes to uh, come apart. Every material will come apart at some point, depending on the temperature and the time. Uh, but that gives us a good idea of how robust the structure is and how it will perform in its application. And, of course, UL rating. Um, the UL rating, uh, there's, there's other attributes to UL beyond flammability, but flammability is often when we talk about, uh, and there's different ratings. I have some technical data on that, so if anybody needs some follow-up, I can, I can share that. Of course, you can go to the UL website. Um, very often, flex materials are rated VTM, uh, VTM0, VTM1, and really it's for very thin materials, and they're often rated with other things that are bonded to. So they're not rated independently. Um, but that's, that's just a little bit on the UL part of it. So um, just looking at uh, uh, high-speed systems or either high-speed digital or RF systems, um, it's becoming a bigger part of flex. Uh, fortunately, flex typically uses rolled annealed copper. As copper foils go, rolled annealed performs better than electrodeposited in high frequency applications. Um, so you're getting both the flexibility benefit of rolled annealed and the high frequency benefit of rolled annealed copper. Um, but it's a system, right? So you have to consider the conductor as well as the, uh, as well as the dielectric. Um, for lower conductor, conductor losses, typically you want a wider circuit, you want more copper, uh, and you also want smoother copper. And again, that you get some of that from the rolled annealed copper. Um, the dielectric is also important as well. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how reference planes work with flex too, and that's coming up in some other slides. Uh, but you know, just just be aware that this is a combination of the materials and the copper foil. And just kind of a shout out to flex uh, Royal Flex circuits. Again, these guys see these designs come through day in and day out. It's, it, it's really advisable to consult with them early in the design process um, to, get, to get the most out of your uh, project. Um, all kinds of examples. And one of the examples I have here is a strip line flex. You know, you want to cut back the no-flow prepreg in just the right way to have, uh, to have a really reliable system. I've seen cases where the, in the rigid portion, some of the resin will flow out into the flex area and actually cut the circuit when it's bent. So again, the fabricator has some great experience and knowledge in this area, and this is where they can help you with the, uh, help you with the design. And then if, if need be, you know, we can, we can um, be consulted as well on the material properties. So we've just got a lot of, 
we've got a lot of people with a lot of specific questions uh, waiting in the Q&A. And okay. we're, we're holding those uh, until the end. But yeah, there's a lot of people that, that want to know more. Okay. Is there, is there anything you think that should be addressed at this point? Um, no, let's, let's keep running through the slides for a minute. Uh, but we've got people wanting to know about perhaps uh, stretchable substrates, um, some stack up designs, you know, if you're doing some high speed, uh, that sort of thing. So if, if the opportunity presents itself, I'll interject and ask you. Okay. All right. Um, so just a, just a review again on some of the materials. So you saw the material types or material families. Uh, this is getting a little bit down into the part number. Um, uh, characteristics. So you have the Pyrolux AP, AG, and AC. They're 100% polyimid systems. Um, there, there is no acrylic or epoxy in those systems. Uh, typically, they're copper clad. AP and AG are double-sided clad systems, uh, where the copper is bound, bonded to directly bonded to the polyimid. Uh, these are your basic building blocks. So if I were to compare it to rigid, these would, this would be your core material. Um, AC is a single-sided clad. Sometimes that's used for three-layer structures. Sometimes it's used for cell phones uh, in a single-layer flex circuit. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers the Motorola Razor. Seems like a long time ago. Uh, that was all Pyrolux AC that connected the, uh, the upper portion to the lower portion. Um, AG and AC, actually, we can, we can provide those in sheeted form or in roll form. So there, there is some real-to-real -real manufacturing in the U.S., but a lot more common in high volume in Asia. But those are available in roll form. I'm actually working with a light manufacturer who's building large format commercial lighting. And they want circuits that are four feet long. And that's a great application for some of that roll clad. Um, the LF and FR adhesive system. Uh, it's been around a very long time, low glass transition temperature, very, very flexible, but reasonably high decomposition temperature. They can work in lead-free assembly um, with, with some uh, good baking practices and shielding of the flex layer and a rigid flex. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the assembly as well, uh, but there are, some, uh, there are some caveats to that. But these materials have been around for a very long time, and they've stood the test of time because they work really well. Uh, Two-year shelf life in its B stage form actually has its roots in a uh, sorry latex paint formulation. Just a little bit of trivia there, um, but they've been around a long time and they 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 continue to be used um, you know in flex manufacture. Uh, LF just a shout not a shout out but just a little qualifier. LF is clear. There is no flame retardant added to LF. That's why it is clear. Um, I've actually worked with an electrostatic speaker project where they wanted a clear dielectric and LF was something that, that fit that need. Um, FR isn't because it's got the flame retardant added uh, for uh, V0 applications. An LF flex may pass flammability because if you have enough polyimid there the, or enough AP there, uh, it may prevent the system from, from burning. Um, but LF, uh, by itself will burn and that's that's why it won't be used in uh, typically in applications that require a U, ULV zero application, even though it might work just fine. Um, LF is very common for medical and military applications where it's not a consumer device, so you don't you don't need the UL rating, but you don't want the the FR additives. So uh, LF is a you know popular in those in those markets. Uh, there's a new product called GPL. It's a thermoset epoxy blend. Um, it, it, has some, it has a lot of high frequency advantages over the LFFR system. So it's a great companion to the AP, AG, and AC systems. Uh, and even the TK, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. Uh, it's, it's white in appearance, it is opaque. Um, and uh, it's undergoing UL, uh, UL testing right now. Um, Right now, the adhesive, the sheet adhesive is available, but the cover lay bond ply are, are going to, uh, where they're combined with uh, Kapton will be coming out uh, soon. Yeah. And then Pyrolux HT, this is actually a very interesting material. HT in combination with AP is the highest uh, rated uh, operating temperature circuit board material combination out there with, uh, that's not ceramic. Okay, so the ceramic's a whole different, um, Ceramic PCBs or fired on PCBs, the co-fired ceramic systems, uh, they're in a world of their own. 
I, I could do a whole presentation on that. So that's a whole nother technology. But when it comes to uh, um, HT and AP, you're talking between a 200 and 225 Celsius continuous operating temperature. There's no other material rated that high. Um, the closest thing would, would, would be a full rigid polyimide system in the rigid world. Uh, and then the Teflon, TK is a Teflon capped on composite. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's for very high speed, very low loss systems. It's also very flexible. The, the Teflon capped on combination makes a very, very bendable system. There's also a companion bomb ply with that. Um, it does require high temperature lamination. Actually, both the HT and the TK require uh, uh, 550 to 600 degree uh, Fahrenheit laminations, whereas the eight, uh, GPL uh, laminates just like the LF and FR acrylic at more conventional temperatures. Hey, Chris, um, something people always ask is price, right? So when we're talking about these, uh, there are some decisions that you can make that can make your project absolutely unaffordable. Uh, what materials kind of fit the, fit the bill of most affordable, I don't want to say cheap because we know they're not, but most affordable um, versus least affordable? Yeah, so good question. Uh, AP is, is laminated in an autoclave uh, system. Um, so these building blocks are cast on a belt um and that's a whole nother technology but then they're they're either the sheets of those are put together uh and then the copper foil is added and then the whole thing goes in the autoclave and gets bonded at very high temperatures that's how ap is made advantages of that of that system are you have very few limits on the, the copper foil types and thicknesses and the ultimate thickness of the polyimide but because the casting is um that has an associated cost when you're doing multiple plies, that can drive the cost way up. So thicker polyamides will, will be exponentially more expensive than thinner ones. AG is made in a roll clad system. So it's cast and then rolled, hot rolled together. Uh, so the cost of manufacturing is much, much lower. You are limited to thinner polyamides though. So basically half, one and two mil polyamides are your limitations on the AG, but it is a much more affordable uh, flex substrate. Um, Again, disadvantages and advantages to both. Both will work in the vast majority of the applications, but there might be reasons to choose one over the other. AC is actually cast on copper. It's only a single-sided product, and that has its applications as well, and its cost points. Um, LF and FR are uh, relatively uh, inexpensive uh, materials for the, for the flex world. Um, and then GPL, I'm not sure of the price point on the GPL at this point. Uh, certainly I can get back to anybody who's interested in that. Um, and HT and TK are premium products. So in other words, use LF and FR when possible, but if you need the attributes of HT and TK, um, you know, certainly those are options. Um, I'll give you a great example. You could do uh, where HT is cost effective. Even though it's more expensive than LF and FR, it may be a lot less uh, costly than doing high temperature cabling. So in other words, you could have, you could have, uh, you know, four, six, or even a dozen circuits on a flex material that could be used in a system that would, that would normally require uh, ceramic coated um, cables, individual cables. So you could save weight and cost in a high temperature system with the HT. Interesting. Bob and Larry, what kind of, uh, projects do you see typically going through the shop? What are people using the most of? Uh, AP is our number one um, user as far as base materials. Um, just like uh, Chris touched on is the, uh, the thermal properties and the thermal expansions working with other products when we do combinations. Uh, LF and FR, um, again, if they want you all rating some of the medical products. So use FR adhesives and bond plies. Um, and then we'll use the uh, base material as an AP. Um, the, the LF is just in some of like uh, some of the older properties where flexibility, single-sided flex is very common. Um, we use it when we build what our dual access where we actually have, you know, a single layer that, that's accessible from the bottom and from the top. So we basically build material. Uh, those are those are very common. HT and TK are a little less common. Uh, we also do some uh, 
uh, FEP bonding, which are higher temps, but they're usually specific applications that, that have to go into a, uh, a really high temp or low temp environment. Okay, thanks. Back to you, Chris. Okay, thanks. Um, so just a little bit of information on AG. AG is relatively new. It's not brand new, but it's, um, it's something we've been introducing over the last 18 months. Uh, again, it's a roll clad. It actually has very good uh, uh, dynamic flex uh, capability. Um, so that's an area. So, so superior flexibility and large format and lower cost are some of the benefits of Pyrolux AG. Uh, where AP is more of the legacy product, um, you know, and available in a lot of different constructions and a lot of different thicknesses, AG uh, is something that, that could be a, a great uh, um, addition to the lineup. And uh, same, by the way, it meets the same uh, IPC 4204 slash 11 slash sheet. So uh, if it's specified as a slash 11 on a print, there's no reason why you couldn't use AG. Um, so it's something that we're, we've been promoting because it's um, uh, available in a lot of different formats. And we're actually doing some of the fabrication or sheeting uh, at in, in Selectro branches, and then we can supply it in sheets or rolls to the fabricators. And then these are some of the available constructions. You can see the ones that are available now and the ones that are coming soon. Uh, and quite a nice lineup of, of constructions and availability on the AG. So we're hoping that that both the fabricators and the OEMs can take advantage of the of the product uh, because it's got some great uh, great properties and it's got a great cost point. So GPL is a new product. Uh, it's it's a very low loss product. Um, just to put it in perspective, an FR4 would be 0 0.020 and it's uh, loss tangent. It's DF. Um, whereas something like Megatron 6 would be somewhere between uh, 0035 and 0041. And you can see the GPL is 0035. Um, and it's a great companion to AP or even AG uh, because those are lower loss materials also. So you get the most out of the, out of the system when you pair a low loss substrate with a low loss adhesive or building block. Um, so this is something we're, we're pretty excited about and we're helping get, uh, get, we're helping DuPont get this, uh, introduced to the industry. Uh, so I, I would expect a lot more of this, you know, in the future. It is white in color and oddly enough, just as a, a trivia point, um, I have a, I have a lighting OEM very interested in it because of the white color. Uh, so what they're going to do is they're going to take Kapton, GPL adhesive and copper foil print etch the copper foil that, rele that reveals the white background for their, for their projects. So um, just another you know, application. Uh, actually, that brings me to something I didn't include in the presentation. We actually have something called LFB, which is, uh, and, and um, uh, the FR version of it as well. It's the Kapton's actually uh, has, has a black pigment in it. So it's black Kapton. There are some reasons why you would want to do that. One of them is if you want to keep the circuitry inside the flex hidden, some OEMs want to do that to help keep their design hidden because it's very difficult to remove that without damaging the circuitry. So let's say you have a proprietary circuit design and you want to keep it hidden, you could use the LFB as a cover lay. Uh, there are some lighting applications where you would want a black surface versus the normal amber surface you would get from the uh, standard cover lay. So GPL and LFB are some applications or some examples of applications where you would want to use uh, something different than the standard cover lay. Again, that's where working with the fabricator and with uh, Inselectro, we can, we can help bring those, that, those options uh, you know, to, to your project. Um, and GPL does have uh, some enhanced thermal performance over LF and FR. It's a higher TG material and, and does very well in, in thermal, uh, thermal applications. It's also very flexible. So it's got good flexibility, it's got good adhesion and good uh, low loss performance uh, or good signal performance, I should say, and, and good um, thermal performance. Um, so TK, that, that's a Teflon capped on laminate, very low dielectric constant, very low loss, uh, good for high speed rigid flex designs. Um, 
Well, one of the challenges is the uh, the bond ply for the TK system requires 550 degree lamination. You could use GPL with the TK and get um, better performance than you would with the acrylic, but you don't have the high temperature lamination you you would need with the TK bond ply. So there is a little bit of a trade-off, but you know, the difference between 002 and 0035 is relatively small compared to 0035 and the 00, uh, or sorry, the, the 0 0.020. So uh, almost 10x the loss of, uh, of, of the TK um, with the uh, standard LF system. So it's a great opportunity to get more performance without having to go through high temperature lamination. And I expect to see a lot more of these designs uh, down the road. So I talked a little bit about HT, how it could be a um, uh, replacement for high temperature cables, uh, especially high temperature coax. Uh, I think this is a very underutilized technology. Of course, I'm a little biased. So, but uh, but this could be uh, could be a great example of where you could make a uh, you could put several uh, several shielded uh, signal layers in a rigid flex or sorry in a flex system it doesn't have to be rigid flex it could be a pure flex system uh, using the HT cover lay and you would end up with a flex circuit that's 100% flexible polyimid film there wouldn't be any acrylic or any epoxy or any Teflon it would be all uh, high temperature polyimid and some pretty outstanding thermal performance. I've actually taken circuits of this and floated them in a solder pot for an hour with no change. <laughs> really? So, yeah, this, this material has very good high temperature characteristics. The, the trick is laminating it at 600 Fahrenheit. There, are, there is some um, uh, know-how that needs to go into the lamination process, but once you get it laminated, it's pretty much, uh, it's, it's pretty much bulletproof. So uh, wow. yeah, very, very impressive and inter interesting. I, again, another underutilized material. There's probably applications where people could use this in environments where, where you need very good high temperature performance. And by the way, it's also quite good in high frequency too. It's 003 in its loss and very respectable in its uh, high frequency performance. So it has all kinds of applications. LCP is a material people are interested in for its uh, high frequency capabilities, but it LCP cold works. So when you bend it, it starts to, uh, the polymer starts to break down. And as you bend it more, it gets worse. Um, GPL, HT, and TK don't have any of those drawbacks in cold working. So uh, much better options for, um, for making uh, uh, bendable circuits. Yeah, I would say, Chris, too, the, uh, the lamination is better on the uh, HT and TK than working with the LCPs. Very, very LCP very because the whole expensive. system melts. So yeah, it's a great, great example, Bob, uh, because with LCP, your, your core, which has your printed edge circuits, that'll melt when you're trying to bond your layers together. Yeah. So we, we used to call it circuit swimming back in the day because <laughs> the circuits look like they're swimming around in the system. So yeah, uh, HT and TK don't have those, those drawbacks. And here's just some examples of TK system where you can barely make out the, uh, the core polyimid versus the uh, the HT uh, encapsulant. The HT film is used both as a cover light and as a bond ply for making multi layer. So you can do you can do either or with that system. Hey Chris, um, we keep talking about the high temperature stuff. What about the the low temperature? Like if we're getting down into minus forty degrees, how does the uh, how do the materials perform? Actually, they perform very well. Uh, I don't have data on GPL in cryogenic temperatures, but we have data on the AP and on the LF system all the way down to uh, just shy of minus 200 Celsius. Whoa. So uh, we have that technical data. If anyone needs uh, uh, cryogenic performance data, we have flexibility and electrical performance data at those temperatures. So no issues. I mean, you know, LF and AP have been used in outer space. Yeah. So I believe the surface of Mars goes from, if it's in direct sunlight, goes from very high temperatures to, to you know, cryogenic temperatures when you're, when you're out of the sun, just like, it, just like you'd see on the moon, because Mars doesn't really have a substantial atmosphere. Very interesting. Of course, it's been used in satellites. I've seen... I've seen uh, Pyrolux systems, basically uh, LF, uh, LF and AP systems, where the antenna is folded up in the satellite and a plastic screw holds everything together. 
and then uh, a section of the board heats up, the screw melts, and the whole thing unfolds. Really? So, uh, yeah. That's so fascinating. There's, yeah, there's, there's been some interesting applications uh, for this stuff. So actually, the heater is part of the circuit printed in the board. And so when the satellite it gets deployed, uh, the circuit triggers the heater just long enough to melt the screw, and then that circuit's no longer used, and then the, then the, uh, system, the system deploys. So, or, or um, yeah, the array deploys at that point. So, yeah, interesting, interesting applications. All right, before we continue, uh, we are nearing the one hour mark, just so our customers have, a, have an idea of how much longer we're going. Do you have an idea of how many slides we have left? Uh, I think only a few. I think somewhere in the neighborhood of four or six. I can go through pretty quickly. and we. Well, no, no, no. I mean, do, do what you need to do. I just want to let people know so they can plan their day. Okay, thanks. Um, so we talked about bendability, about bend radius. Um, you can see some examples on the right-hand side where you have a hard bend and then you have different bend radiuses. There are some design rules. I won't, I won't read this through at this point. We'll make the slides available to anybody who wants them. But again, folks like, folks like Bob are great consultants on this, uh, on how to do uh, the design. Uh, typically, you want to put your heavier, heavier coppers in the center, what we call the neutral bend axis. And then the next slide, you can see what happens uh, when you have a lot of copper layers. Um, you tend to stretch the outer layer and compress the inner layer. There are design ways to manage or design um, tricks to manage this. And again, that's where I recommend you work with the fabricator up front so you know what you're getting. And you also know what the limitations are for a particular uh, stack up. And then one of the things going back to flex, right? This shows a side view right here. But then if you look at it in the other axis, uh, one of the ways to get much better flex performance or bend performance is to do, uh, uh, to stagger the circuits and not have the I-beam effect. And this is something, believe it or not, I still see happen uh, when someone does a circuit layout. And maybe some of the folks on this call uh, know this uh, already and been through this, uh, but I wanted to make sure that, you know, that everyone's aware once again, you know, the fabricator will, will uh, alert you when, when things like this happen. So the structure on the left is much better for bending. Yeah, it also helps us in production as well, Chris, because uh, the topography on the surface from the stack that, you know, gives you an issue and resist coating and drilling sometimes. And, and lamination, yeah, great and point. Lamination. So, so the one on the left is, uh, you know, the one preferred with the offsets, we, we get a much uh, flatter surface coming out and it's just much more manufacturable and again it bends much better on top. so from a manufacturability standpoint certainly that's uh the preferred way to go but from a electrical engineering standpoint one of the reasons that we would typically want to stack at least in a rigid design is to reduce the electromagnetic emissions right every signal needs a return path and the closer you can get those the less trouble you're going to have down the road so that brings me to another question. What about uh, ground planes, cross-hatched versus solid? Yeah, so you probably already looked at the slides because <laughs> that's coming up. So, okay, uh, I, I didn't <laughs> actually. Um, no, that was a question I was just bringing into. So, so cross, yeah, so cross-hatched ground planes um, have been used in flex a long time for a long time, and they have a lot of upside. There are some downsides, um, but. This is way more preferred over a solid reference plane. Um, of course, it changes the structure, um, but it does provide better flexibility. It provides better performance and assembly because it provides a moisture egress. Um, there are some signal limitations, which I have another slide on, uh, but it, um, it's very, very good for flex circuits. Um, there was a study done by HD Pug I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well, uh, but um, uh, for bending, it's it's just a, a huge benefit on on the circuit, uh, much more flexible, um, and again, it provides a moisture egress. It also allows you to get a higher impedance in a thinner structure, which is also very important for flexibility. So and then, uh, and then also with the uh, cross hatch, there's different angles you can use, right, to get a little more copper, but still get the as a 30 degrees versus a 45, right? So. Yeah, great segue into, into this next section here. So um, HTPUG looked at openings and, and also uh, patterns 
basically a diamond pattern versus a circle. Uh, and they looked at performance and flexibility. Again, this, we can make this data available. Uh, this was presented publicly, uh, but they did a study on this, uh, looking at the signal performance um, and the size of the opening. And then you can see here some of the signal performance, cut, the frequency cutoffs. Um, and actually the round, the round pattern gave you better high frequency performance uh, versus a, a diamond pattern. And it makes perfect sense because if you go back to this, you can see the, uh, the round will have less, less of an opening. Uh, but, you know, also uh, the, the, the shape of the opening uh, seems to have an effect as well. So if your frequency uh, isn't real high, you can, you can use the uh, uh, different size openings. And the smaller the opening, the higher in frequency you can go. Any opening is better than none. I have a very good paper on moisture and PCBs and how long it takes the moisture to get out depending on the openings. Uh, I can make that available to anybody who's interested, but it's very important to get the moisture out prior to assembly. All, material, all plastics are hydroscopic to some degree. Um, and if you don't get the moisture out in assembly, it could make a, a perfectly fine circuit board go, go south and nobody wants that. So um, uh, there, again, the crosshatch ground plane has a lot of different benefits, uh, both in flexibility and in, and in um, assembly performance. And as long as you manage the, uh, the shape and the size of the opening, you can go higher in frequency without, uh, without limitations or without negative uh, uh, signal performance effects. So just a shout out, we're almost done with the presentation. Just a shout out to some other technologies. Um, uh, flex material has been used for embedded capacitors. Uh, it provides both capacitance, but more importantly, and this is something I've learned from Rick Hartley is that when you make your power and ground uh, layers, dielectric layers thinner, you lower the, uh, the power distribution networks uh, inductance and you don't need as many surface capacitors. So that's an example of where a flex material, because you can go thinner, you can go down to, to e even as thin as eight microns uh, with flex materials, which you can't do with glass reinforced materials. That provides a big benefit in the power distribution network in, in um, in multi-layers, rigid multi-layers. There is also a flavor of AP where you have resistor material on the back side of the copper foil, it's called APR, where you can print and etch your resistors in your flex design. Um, there are screenable components, and of course there's Z-axis interconnects. Typically we don't use those in the, in the flexible portion, but they can be used to join a flex portion to a rigid portion. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of design possibilities there as well. So just want to uh, do a little shout out to some other technologies we haven't covered. And that's pretty much the end of the presentation if we want to take some questions. Yeah, we've got quite a few. So thank you everyone for hanging out with us. Uh, we appreciate it. I know it's uh, probably eaten into your lunchtime, so sorry about that. But let's start with, with one. Uh, Davey has been quite active in the Q&A section. He wants to know if there's any material stack up that can withstand the tension of a battery holder for a coin cell or a quadruple A battery. Um, so I think what he's asking there is, can you get away with a flex only design, maybe a flex with stiffeners and not go to rigid flex or would you need to? Uh, so actually, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, and, and you know, that's probably where a discussion would be more valuable, but I think the question is, is with the copper foil pop off the substrate. That's where I believe this, the, so let's say you bonded the copper foil to a, uh, a coin uh, or some other type of battery, right? And uh, the copper foils bonded, soldered, welded, whatever to the, uh, to the structure. Um, believe it or not, with most flex materials, the, the copper foil adhesion strength to the dielectric is stronger than it would be on rigid. Very often with AP, we're talking about eight to 20 pounds of peel strength where a rigid material, a rigid laminate would be uh, somewhere closer to six to eight pounds. Um, so there's no reason why it wouldn't work as long as the other mechanical attributes are, are met. So perhaps put in some stiffeners, uh, maybe do some via stitching to bond, the mul bond multiple layers, really just uh, stiffen it up. I, I think really that would help keep the, the, the batteries together. Um, but it, you know, that would be, yeah, cause it's a flex material, but yeah, you could use a stiffener, uh, system 
to, to keep the package. I, I would probably need to know more about the, uh, the, the requirements or the goals. Uh, but from a just a pure copper adhesion to dielectric standpoint, the flex should really be better than rigid. Interesting. All right. So Davey, uh, follow up with Chris directly or one of our associates. If you contact Ricky at royalflexcircuits.com, he, um, he should be able to direct you to one of our engineers, Bob, uh, Larry, somebody who can answer it. Chris, I'm telling you, the guy's a walking encyclopedia. It's worth a phone call. Um, we've got another question from Davey. Are any rigid flex materials appropriate for milling? I'm going to let Bob handle that one. Um, I, and I believe he's referring to mechanical. Uh, the rest of the question says, like with LPKF, PCB mill laser, or rotating bit. So I think he's oh, asking. Gotcha. Go yeah. Um, yes, you can use the, uh, those laser systems to fab the flex. You can both ablate the copper, and you can also cut the substrate, depending on the setting of those laser machines. Um, yeah. Yeah, typically when we build a rigid flex, Chris, we will uh, route the our route out the flex with a laser, and the rigid, you know, go mechanical most times. We don't route much uh, fiberglass because it burns too much on the on the lasers themselves. So, uh, real thin applications. But as far as cutting, doing some depth control, meaning uh, depth milling or skiving on the laser, that's pretty common. Typically, you wouldn't mill much of a flex because they're so thin, and you're you're dealing with a, a different different animal there. But uh, get a lot more tearing than cutting. I would. Yeah, imagine. well, there's not a need. You can sometimes build the flexes at different levels, so that the milling requirements. Aren't, yeah, just aren't th those good. are yeah those all you know, all great points. Um, one little caveat though, the flex material does absorb UV energy um, and laser energy readily. So if you're blading a copper only, you have to be careful, but it is possible. It is doable. And these are pretty uh, low power lasers too, aren't they, Bob? Eh, well, they range from area two watts to, to 15 watts. Um, we generally, when we do that type of cutting, I mean, you have to run a little hotter to get through the copper, but when we go through the captons and stuff, we'll run at a lower temp with more passes. So we allow the material to cool that we're not just trying to you know, cut it really quick with a with a big torch as opposed to going through and, and just making multiple uh, 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 lower power passes to get a cleaner cleaner edge. Okay. All right. So what about my prototype designs, right? Um, I, most places I go to, I'm going to have to buy a panel. I mean, if I've got something that's the size of a, you know, a playing card, I don't want a big old 18 by 12 panel for a single prototype. Is Is there any way you guys can work with me on that? Uh, typically, I mean, special, more expensive materials, sometimes, uh, especially the Teflons and some of the real, real high-end ceramics, we actually build six by six panels and nine by 12, things like that. Um, oh, so I can just get a small panel. But with flex, th there's other issues, but, you know, 12 by 18 is kind of our typical automated tooling. So even though you might have a smaller part, we might just populate the middle of the board of the array. Because at that point, the material is less of a driver than, than the processing. Um, panel size generally comes into play when you're doing more volume and, and, and layout, things like that. So prototyping, you're, you're, buying, you're probably buying time in the shop as much as the, the base cost of the materials. I mean, that's why it's really the real high end, you know, the three, $400 a square foot material that they'll, they'll run the smaller uh, panel size. And not all shops do that, but we're, we're pretty flexible that way. We can, uh, we've ran panels as small as six by six, <laughs> customer supplied, you know, some really thick uh, ceramic materials. So, um, but, but typically we run on a, a 12 by 18, um, but we do have all kinds of panel size. If it fits a design better, we'll, we'll use it. Okay. Uh, we've got a question. Uh it really is. Have things changed on what's reasonable to be done in the United States versus China? Um, so at what point do we come back onshore or move offshore? Uh, it's a combination of technology and, and pricing, right? Some of the, the tougher technologies and, and, and how we process. Um, a lot of jobs are driven to be here by ITAR, right? You can't, we can't go overseas with them. Um, but uh, the, the 
the type of material sometimes you get overseas can't be matched here and vice versa. Um, uh, yeah, so that request us. They actually in, in Korea where they buy our materials to build products, you know, um, mm. because they, they don't have the uh, those products that are readily available in, in Korea. So yeah, to, to add to that, a lot of flex circuit manufacturer in Asia has done reel to reel. Uh, so unless you have very large volume, it's just not feasible. Um, and then the other thing is, is um, those reel to reel flexes tend to be not as complex. Um, uh, the U.S. circuit, the flex circuit manufacturers are much better at doing any kind of specialty product uh, process. Um, their, their manufacturing area is just better suited for it. Um, if you're doing tens of thousands of parts, certainly. Uh, where the breakoff is between Asia and the U.S. really depends on the, a lot on the circuit design. You know, single and double-sided, um, if it's, you know, a few hundred pieces to maybe even a thousand pieces of U.S. might make more sense. If it's tens of thousands of parts, then you want to go to, to, to Asia. Um, but if it starts, if you start to get into, uh, you know, special cutouts or fillets or uh, rigid flex, loose leaf, you're much better off with a U.S. manufacturer. Um, okay. And, and typically those aren't high volume anyway. Right. All right. Um, so we've got a few more questions and I do want to be respectful of people's times. We'll end here at uh, 1220, which is in seven minutes. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm looking for one regarding assembly. Somebody had, okay. Uh, can you explain component assembly cost difference versus rigid boards? How big is the difference and what notes should we consider for component selection like footprint? So, what assembly considerations do we need to know about if we're doing a flex design or a rigid flex design? Uh, I'm going to let Bob take the second half of this. I'll take the first half is um, with rigid flex assembly, very often you want to shield the flex section. So there might be some additional fixturing costs. Typically they're not very bad or very, very high, but you do have to be careful because the flex area being thinner and being amber and colored, it will absorb the IR energy in, a re, in an IR reflow system much faster than the rigid portion. So that is a consideration. Uh, the other is you may have to mechanically support because everything gets soft during the heat of assembly. So you might have to mechanically uh, support the part. Uh, but Bob, I don't know, Bob, you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, and what we see is it's where you're putting the components as far as design is that you obviously, if you put components near bend areas, there's a chance that you could get cracking or lifting in the solder joints there. Um, we, we had a, a customer that was building an electronic door, uh, door knobs and stuff that for your smartphones to open and close. And, and that was a struggle for them to keep parts in, in, where they literally wanted them on the bend. So, uh, but th that's what the stiffeners would be. Now, as far as assembly, quite often with flex, we'll build a frame um, that may not even go into the board itself, but it supports the array of the, of the flex. So we'll put that in at the end and, and that'll give the rigid frame, which will go on the assembler's track or, or they, they'll have additional cassetting that they'll set up. But uh, definitely the parts uh, supported even by a thicker capped on, it's not always a rigid stiffeners. And a lot of times we push people to the flex, uh, especially in the quick turn market, because we can, we can press those all at the same time and save some cycle time in cost. But uh, reinforcing it with, you know, as much as a five mil capped on under the uh, parts area will, will keep them from, uh, you know, bending in the, the wrong spot once you've laid down your, your, your components. Interesting. All right. Uh, let's do one more. For those of you who aren't getting your specific questions answered, please uh, email Ricky at Royal Flex Circuits and he'll direct it. Uh, some of those things are specific to your design. So I'm trying to skip over those and hit the more generic things. Um, what about stretchable substrates? Do we have anything where it, it's not just uh, flexible, but you know, it can also stretch a little? Yeah, so uh, that's getting into the printed electronics world. There are different kinds of flexible substrates. Some of them are clear film based. Uh, you know, so they might be an EVA film. Um, 
and different uh, different types of polymers. And then there's also the uh, the thermoplastic uh, uh, polyurethane, or um, uh, so the, the what we call the TPI systems and uh, again, printed electronics because the copper foil wouldn't flex, wouldn't stretch with the substrate. So you're using conductive inks that are uh, basically polymer metal flake composites that would stretch with the uh, either the fabric or the or the stretchable film. So, but stretchable electronics really isn't in the realm of flexible PCBs where you do assembly reflow. All the systems I mentioned that are flex that are stretchable would require conductive adhesives to join the components to the circuit. Uh, haven't experienced a case where two rigid boards were joined with a stretchable um, conductive uh, substrate or interface. I suppose it's possible. Could be a new, a new area of R&D. Um, but printed electronics is a whole nother field and is worthy of a whole nother presentation. Um, but the, the solderable substrates typically aren't stretchable. Uh, with that said, I have seen Kapton used in strain sensors where there is some stretching going on, uh, but it's, it's not to the degree I think where, uh, where your uh, person asking the question is talking about. Uh, well, I, I think that person has enough questions that uh, they need to contact you directly. It's they, they seem to be asking about a specific design or designs they have in mind. Okay. With that, I would like to thank everybody for hanging out for a wonderful hour and 20 minutes with Chris Hunrath, Bob Meyer, and Larry Ibarra of Royal Flex Circuits. This webinar was brought to you by Advanced Assembly in, of Aurora, Colorado, and Royal Circuits of California. We're going to return next week with this, the extension of this webinar at the exact same time. So next Thursday at 11 o'clock Pacific time. For those of you who would like a copy of the recording that will be available on our YouTube channel and at the royalcircuits.com blog within two business days. And we'll also ask Chris for PDFs of his slides and put them up there for you as well. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful day and you stay safe. Uh, Chris, Bob, Larry, thank you so, so much for your time today. You're quite welcome. welcome Mark. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Oh, hey. No, the pleasure was all mine. I'll see you guys next week. Take care. Bye. Take care, Chris. Thanks. Take see care. you, Bob. Bye. Bye.